Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us um, today and taking time out of your day to be with us here live for a great webinar from Engage to Excel, brought to you by Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards. We're going to talk about the relationship between pre-hire and early recognition and definitely touch a lot on candidate experience today, especially during that stage. And we want to welcome you all. Before I introduce um, our main speakers, just real quick housekeeping. Uh, we are recording this webinar, but again, we're glad you're here live. We'll make it available tomorrow to you all. And if you have questions, you can either A, post them to the Q&A part of the Zoom dashboard or just use chat. Either way is fine. We'll be monitoring it. If we do get timely questions, we'll try to interject with the speakers and um, ask them during that time. And then, of course, we'll take questions at the end, too. So welcome again, everybody. And let me go ahead and introduce um, Darren Finley and Emily Gatton from Engage to Excel. And Darren, I'll let you both, if you want to say a little bit more about yourselves and take it away. Sounds like a plan. So hello, I'm Darren Finley. I'm the president of Recruitment Solutions at Engage to Excel. Been at Engage to Excel about seven years. And I'm responsible for leading our team of recruiters and sourcing team and candidate care team across all of our customer base where we do recruitment solutions. I live in Franklin, Tennessee, which is just south of Nashville, Tennessee. And like Kevin mentioned, you got a kind of a glorious day going on today. Lots of nice sunshine and, and perfect weather. But we're glad you're in or on your back porch or wherever you are uh, with us today. And hopefully we can share some good information with you. Emily? Hi, I am Emily Gatton. I lead the professional services team at Engage to Excel and have been with the organization for coming up on probably 18 years. My role today is really primarily around leading our solutions and implementation team. I would say the favorite part for me is working with organizations who have unique challenges and less being creative and trying to solve problems and really determining the right way to reach employees so that they care more about the organization and the work that they do and ultimately produce better business results. I am in North Carolina today. Our weather is beautiful here as well. And I look forward to the time together. Cool. Thanks, Emily. One of the things we wanted to do is for a lot of people might be new on the call, just do a very brief overview and introduction of who Engage to Excel is. And while we've been in business for over 131 years now, it's just kind of hard to believe that an organization stays intact for that long. We're so proud of the fact that we started out uh, really in the recognition business have changed, you know, along the way adopted new technology and, and really kind of innovate technology as we go. We've been honored to be part of the talent board and been a global underwriter since 2019. And we believe in the mission. We believe in creating great experiences. So whether you're a candidate or whether you're an employee, we believe great experiences drive engagement overall. We've been honored by the HRO today, Baker's Dozen. And actually we're the only organization in the world that have been recognized for all three of these solutions together. So both recognition, employee engagement surveys, and recruitment solutions have been recognized as part of the Baker's Dozen globally. So we're excited about that. And then Everest the Peak Matrix has been have recognized both of us as well around rewards and recognition and recruitment. And with, again, like I so said, we've been in business for quite a long time. We've constantly changed, constantly more with the market that's out there. We're a global organization that have offices really across the globe from Chicago, Montreal, Bangalore, and Krakow. And when you think of kind of what we do overall, I like to show this graphic because it helps people understand that we really service organizations in a lot of different ways with these five things. I like to call it a pie. Some people call it a wheel, but as you can see, I like pie. So I won't go deep into my love for pie, but you can buy a slice of pie or you can buy the whole pie in this example. Each one of these things you see here from recruiting to onboarding to recognition to how we use developing leaders into our survey have both a software component as well as a delivery component. And so we really try to think about how to create that great career experience throughout the entire talent life cycle overall. And so as we think about that and you think about kind of where we are today, here are the things that we like to cover with you a little bit. I'm a, a nerd and kind of a data junkie when it comes to the labor market. So we'll talk a little bit about that 
we'll talk about you know what candidates are saying today and we do that from our job seeker survey our trend indicators report has gone out and surveyed candidates every year in the last five or six years and what we find is that some trends change some things stay the same we're going to be really interested and excited about sharing some of that with you today as you think about building your strategy what data points are you going to use to build that strategy where has the market been where are candidate preferences going and kind of lead you down that road as well. We'll talk about some onboarding impacts and then recognition ideas. At the very end, I hope we have some time, which I think we will, just to collaborate with you and look for input from you around new ideas and out of the box ideas on how you recognize either your candidates or your current employee base along the way. But first let's talk about the labor market, this crazy labor market that we're in. And it's, it's interesting to me to hear like the labor market is cooling and we've seen a slowdown. And yes, if you go back five months ago, we had almost 12 million open jobs. Today, that number is down to 8.8 .8 million open jobs. And the unemployment rate has come down from, you know, four over 4%, you know, a couple of years ago, down to three and a half now to 3.8 as of last month. There's still this real tight labor market that's out there. And the other interesting thing that I found out this week is I was doing research for our conversation today, just kind of updating the information. Anybody have any idea about how many people we've added to the labor market over just the last couple of years? Kind of think about that for a second. Well, that seems really tight. Are we losing people in the labor market? We've actually added 7 million people into the workforce just in the last two years. And that's kind of mind blowing when you think about that. That's due to immigration. And so there are people coming back into the labor force. But then you look at that number in the bottom right and you go, hey, labor participation rate is still just about 62%. It hasn't really changed much. And honestly, this 62.8% bump we got over the last four months has been the first time it's gone up really actually the last five months. So we're seeing increased labor participation rate. We're also seeing significant population growth. And so the population has actually grown uh, really about uh, 2 million in the last two years. So if the population's only grown by 2 million, but 7 million more people are in the labor force than before, that just means that more people are coming out and working today. But we still have 8 million open jobs. We still have really low unemployment. So the labor market is going to remain tight across the board. We've heard about layoffs in different sectors. Uh, but quite honestly, when you look at layoffs overall, they're still kind of below pre-pandemic averages. So there's not been a ton of mass layoffs. There's some segmented layoffs. Recruiting got hit pretty hard this year of layoffs. IT got hit hard, hard last year and already this year as well. So at the end of the day, kind of what we find overall, that it's going to be really important for all of us to be able to capture those candidates that we want, get them through the recruiting process in a very efficient way, in a very engaging way, and then keep them along the way as well. And when we think about it kind of on that track, we think about what it looks like to do that overall. So Emily, I'll kind of, I'm going to flip it over to you as we kind of go back and forth and talk about some of these uh, data points. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that any of us would be surprised that those 7 million extra people are coming in and they have higher expectation for their experience at work. I think that we're seeing that all over post-pandemic. The employee experience is becoming more and more important. Because when you create a great employee experience, we see that 60% of employees are more likely to stay with the company, 69% are more likely to be high performers, and 52% are more likely to report high discretionary effort. I recently did some research that compared the pre-pandemic employee experience to be about the work location. Did we provide adequate lighting? How was the break room? Did employees have room to share and collaborate in shared spaces? But now that conversation is shifting and it's going to continue down that path. It's no longer about the location, but instead it's about creating a human-centered employee experience. And that means that you really prioritize the human as your core pillar of your work design. So you integrate flexibility, you integrate empathy into your work policies. And when you embrace that approach, you can reduce work fatigue by 44%, increase their intent to stay by 45%, and improve excuse me, improve performance by 
But lucky for us, that human-centered approach, it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be costly. And we can reap incremental benefits just by digging in a bit deeper to understand what employees want. And recognition is the key component in that. You know, it's kind of interesting, even, even as you talk through that, I mean, I think about how even the title of a lot of our partners have changed in the last 30 years. It's gone from a personnel department, the human resources department, the human capital. So I think we're all kind of searching for that, or the talent, you know, the talent, chief talent officers. So you think about all of those different titles, trying to describe what we do. Maybe human-centric officer is next. I don't know. But. <laughs> But I think that is kind of the core of our of our discussion today, and, and kind of where we need to go. When you think about the um, the, the way we we go about this, the way we look at this survey and the research that we did, I just give you some highlights. Now we had fifteen hundred people involved in the research. Uh, we tried to do half and half of active and, and and passive candidates along the way. Pretty much half and half around male and female. All industries on this. And so we've got some really good broad-based data across all industries, all types of candidates and employees that would be answering a lot of our questions. And when you think about, in my mind, I go through this kind of chronologically. So we'll kind of do that a little bit today as we talk about some of the data. But when you look at how important is the company's recognition and rewards program on the company's website. So one of the things that we know, as Emily mentioned, is that recognition is a key component to build an engaged workforce. It's not the only component. You've got to have some security there. You've got to have competitive compensation. You've got to have growth and development opportunities, but you also need to have a recognition program that is not just a program, but something that's lived out in the life of your human-centric organization that you're going to have. And when we polled the candidates and the potential candidates that were out there, we, we find that they agree with that. And they say, how important is it for you to highlight that on your company's website because they're researching either because a recruiter called out or now they're interested in your products or however they got to your website. They want to know, you know, how, how you do rewards and recognition. How do you recognize each other in the organization? 67% of, of those say it's extremely or very important or important to understand how you deliver on those rewards and recognition within your own organization overall. And then when you think about that process, that's, that's the start. That's how they come to understand you. They talk to a recruiter, they go to your website, they understand that how important is it to be praised or recognized during each step of the recruiting process along the way. And you can see across the board, whether it's pre-offer, whether it's post-offer, but before their first day, during their onboarding experience, after onboarding is complete, there's a real strong desire for individuals to be recognized for their contribution, for who they are, for their background. And so it's important as you develop your candidate engagement and your new hire engagement strategy, as you think about how do we plug in recognition moments along the way? We hope to provide, again, more of that for you today as we continue our conversation. And when you think about what candidates say as well, in, in the part where there's a lot of competition still that's out there. So there's only 8.8 .8 million open jobs today. There's only about four and a half to five million people still looking for work from the unemployment standpoint. You're competing all the time. And so when you think about the people who are currently with you today and the amount of times they're being hit and bombarded by recruiters or other opportunities, you understand that this number has not changed a whole lot. During, right after the pandemic, we saw it jump up the number of candidates that were willing to learn about a new opportunity to 100%. We couldn't believe it. Everybody said they were willing to learn about a new opportunity. They dropped down a little bit in 2022 and then jumped right back up to 97%. So remember, your employees have open ears. They're interested in learning about what's out there and where can I continue to get the things that I need uh, as an employer, as, as Emily mentioned earlier, whether it's the right workplace, whether it's the right social environment, whether it's the right work itself, overall, they want to learn about that. So keep that in mind about what candidates are saying. We also talk to them about, you know, would a personalized gift at the time of offer influence your acceptance? And we see really since 2021, yes, or definitely some kind of company swag, right? Something to, and we use from an IO psychology standpoint to validate their decision, that they're making a good decision and recognize them along the way, praise them along the way for making the right decisions, will adhere them 
and keep them kind of close in and tight to your organization. So there's a lot of um, impact that you can create by some kind of company swag um, at the time of offer. And then at the top right hand side, you can see, would you consider another offer if contacted? Again, candidate risk always, right? So how many candidates, when you look at your funnel, are you converting from offer accept to start? That's a really important metric because a lot of the work has happened, but it's not done yet, you know, before they accept the offer. So we can kind of see these numbers. And if you look at that top line, it said, you know, would you consider another job offer of contact between the time you have accepted the offer and your first day? Well, in 2019, pre-pandemic, 45%, yeah, I'll consider another offer. We thought that was alarmingly high then. And then you look at what happened right after the pandemic in 21 at 57%. 61% in 2022 and 58% in 2023. So there, half of your new hires that have already accepted your job would consider another offer coming at them. So it's important to engage them. It's important to recognize them. It's important to hold them close and keep them uh, really involved in the onboarding process. And one of the ways you can do that is participate in social community of the organization. It's interesting that over half of the respondents in the last three years have said, you know what, I would be interested in participating in some kind of social community, whether it's a softball team, whether it's something to do around Habitat for Humanity, some kind of charitable organization, anything that would get me tied into your organization, I would be interested to do, even if there are no job openings. That tells me a couple of things. One, it tells me that we've done a better job of articulating our EVPs that are out there. We've done a better job of being involved in a larger community and where, where we live and where we work to draw people in. So I think that that's also something part of your strategy to think through is how can you involve people outside of your organization into your community and your social events that you have along the way. I think when you work through that, you know, pipeline, that candidate funnel along the way, I kind of get here and I think about, again, how efficiently am I using my funnel? What are the risks and the positives that I have. And we've seen around accepting jobs, what candidates are telling us. And, and we see kind of the same things really around respect and recognition, compensation and job fit. And those have kind of been the same really for the last three to five years overall. They might have changed just a little bit from around the percentages that you see there. But at the end of the day, the top reason, the number one reason why people accept a job offer is the recognition they receive, the appreciation they receive going through the process and the level of respect that they're given during that process. And when you think about candidate experience and what the talent board is all about, we think about kind of great candidate experience. They can receive these things, receive that recognition, be shown that appreciation and be given respect you know, through timely communications and things like that along the way. It doesn't mean that compensation is not important. I think everybody on this call probably had to worry about a job being declined due to compensation or counter offers, but you can absolutely impact that from a mitigation standpoint by showing the respect throughout the process itself. Because then when you jump to the other side, when you look at the top three reasons for rejecting offers, it's not, un it's not the same, really. You look at, you've got recognition kind of across the board, but you've got these things at the bottom, poor job fit, fair and equitable compensation have kind of gone back and forth along the way. But recognition and respect for that candidate is in that process it goes such a long way to help you get uh, through the process so that those candidates feel like they've been valued and, and appreciated and respected during the process overall. So we're excited about helping you understand that as well. At the same time, we want to figure out, you know, why employees leave overall. And these have changed a little bit more. You look at, you know, why employees that you have today, and again, from Emily and I's perspective, we're almost kind of working at it from two sides, right? We're going to help you go find the right candidates and get them onboarded. She's going to help you onboard them and keep them along the way. So we want to know why are they leaving, right? So you look at fair and equitable compensation, lack of recognition, appreciation, concerns about both work conditions and job security. You can see kind of vacillate there toward the bottom. They're always kind of the same ones across the board. And so what we've seen in the last year, we saw equitable and fair compensation jump up a little bit to number one again from a lack of recognition appreciation in 2022 to kind of getting back to the norm of these are the top two reasons around recognition, respect, and appreciation, 
and fair and equal compensation are the top two reasons why individuals leave the organization. Hey, Darren. Yep. I've, I've got a question for you that relates to what you, you've just been sharing, especially, can you go back a slide, especially about the lack of recognition and appreciation? I couldn't agree more on our data totally aligns with this, that the, the more engagement that a new hire gets before day one, for example, um, is makes a big difference for retention starter out of the gate. One thing that I wanted to add to it, and this is still more on, again, pre day one, but what I'm, we're always struck by every year, the candidates tell us only about 40% on average year after year are getting a call from their hiring manager prior to starting. This is, ex this is outside of, you know, interview process, right? Um, do you have any, you know, any thoughts, any recommendations on that? Because I know that, you know, sometimes that's out of recruiting's purview, right? When it comes, but how can they encourage <laughs> the hiring managers to, you know, engage more before they start? Across job types, by the way, too. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's critical. And if you think about, and let me show you some more data in just a second, but as you think through, you know, the impact uh, that individuals have on that candidate's decision to, to start, the perfect segue really into, into this slide, Kevin, around the importance of that recognition and communication. So I'm going to let Emily answer that question as she talks about this slide. And at the end, we've got some other recommendations as well. So thank you. Up and we're getting us right into this next slide. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, Kevin, I don't think you could have set that up any better. So thank you for that. For me, I, my education and background is in psychology. And so I think a lot about how we as people have an innate need to feel needed and to feel wanted. And I think recognition plays into that. So on the left, you see how employees rank the importance of different types of recognition. And despite the diversity of our workforces, despite unique motivations that different people have, different groups have, you see that nearly everyone wants recognition and they want it primarily first and foremost from their immediate supervisor. So, I mean, it's not surprising that people want that, not only from the immediate supervisor, as you see here, they also want it for their stellar performance, their length of service, recognition by their peers for their birthday, but that immediate supervisor still trumps all forms. So I think that what you're pointing out is the same thing that we see as well, is that as you think about creating that great candidate experience, or even when they're already onboarded into your organization, finding ways to engage and involve the immediate supervisor will be a key to success. And I think as simple as creating a process or a procedure, telling the hiring managers the expectation is there for them to make that phone call is a starting point because that personal connection through a phone call will make a difference. Darren will talk in a minute about some other ways that we can encourage that emotional connection during that pre-hire stage but I think that emotional connection is a key component of that. Even as Darren was talking about getting involved in community um, projects or things that are meaningful to that employee, again, it's creating the emotional connection into who I am as an individual, the things that I care about, and aligning that to the organization, and then providing a person in my manager or in the hiring manager that I can feel the connection to. On the right, though, you'll also see employee feelings towards the amount of recognition that they received at work. 61% say they're satisfied, but only 56% believe that they are fairly rewarded. So it looks like everyone agrees that recognition is important. And isn't that great that we can get all employees almost to agree on something that's uh, life changing sometimes when you're working in human resources, um, but we still have a gap to close on how we deliver the recognition effectively. And as we've alluded to, and as you bring up, Kevin, it really starts during the hiring and onboarding process. So we can talk next about some different ideas and some success that we've seen and how to create that great experience and make sure that employees show up on the first day. Thanks, Emily. So that is a great key that's right into that, that onboarding impact. And it kind of goes to Kevin's question as well, when you look at the interaction with employees overall. And the survey asks questions like, how important is it as a candidate for you to have interaction with other employees along the way? And so pre-offer 
said it was. 74% said post hour before first day. So Kevin, that 40% said that, hey, I need to talk to that hiring manager. It's 74% on our survey came back because that is really important to talk to someone else in the organization before that first day. And then during onboarding, it's critically important. And everybody defines onboarding and pre-boarding a little bit differently. So I think it's also important to understand in your own organization, what is pre-boarding and what is onboarding and what are the levers you're going to pull during pre-boarding? What are the levers you're going to pull, you know, during onboarding to make sure that there's this interaction that occurs with those new hires along the way? And we really found out that it's important and that that interaction and that emotional connection, as Emily just said, is extremely important. Because 70% will say that that first day will impact their decision to stay over a month. That's just a, that's just a month. That first day is so important if you have a well-organized and a, a great experience. 66% said that the, the total onboarding experience would impact their decision to stay for an organization more than a year. So as you think about your onboarding plan and what that would look like, how long does your onboarding go? Is it one day and done? Thanks, I'm done, I'm HR, I'm out, right? Is it a 90-day training period, a six-month training period? What does that look like? So I encourage you to think through Again, how important it is to candidates and new hires, but also so that your strategy marries up with the level of importance that they're going to have until they get to be 100% productive in their role and understand their way around the organization. And again, we also believe, and I want to show you a case study around this personalized, personalized gift being sent to a candidate and the, their willingness to take a job offer and start, which is so amazing to me. We did a case study with one of our clients and one of the things that we found, we sent these onboarding welcome gifts that are branded to that organization. We would send them to their home before they started. And so a couple of things happen here. Number one, you know, Amazon comes to the door, the dog starts barking, the doorbell rings, what's going on? It kind of causes some chaos. I'm always going to who ordered what, you know, in our house. And it's usually not me. But I'm like, what in the world is it that came to our house again today? And we go see that, hey, there's something special something unexpected. I love the Zappos kind of created this model of surprise and delight. And so it's kind of along that same model that the onboarding welcome gift is sent to the new hire's home. They can open it. It becomes a, an event that happens with everyone in the household, whether it's a significant other, whether it's children. We found some fantastic results of that we saw this significant decrease in no-shows on the first day. And you implemented an all-welcome gift that happened before they actually started. I go, well, Darren, that's a lot of money. I, well, you know, you've already spent a lot of money trying to just post the job. It costs less than a job posting to send, you know, a welcome gift to someone's home before they start. And the increase in the show rate is significantly higher. Let me go back, so I wasn't quite finished there, hit the screen too soon. And then the other piece that I think is also important is that we saw this 42% reduction in the first 90 day tunnel. So this organization, had a, a lot of issues with people showing the first day and then them being retained after that. And there wasn't just wasn't just onboarding gift that impacted the 42% reduction. The 67% first day show rate, I believe, was a big part of it. But you know what? We got the hiring managers involved. And they understood the importance of not only getting them to start, having a great experience in the recruiting process, but also on their first day and also in their first 90 days. So Clients that look at this from a different perspective and say, hey, well, if they don't show, whoo, we didn't spend that money on onboarding box. It's pretty naive overall. So we want you to kind of think through that and think about what that looks like in your organization and build a process, because it is process oriented, that will deliver results overall. You got to have a repeatable process. So it's the same for all the tenants that come through. And so that, you know, some individuals don't get it, some do creates then ill will in the organization overall. Yeah, Darren, one thing I like about that too is I think it still creates that emotional connection. So you receive this gift at home, you're opening it with your spouse or your kids. They start to get excited because your organization's reaching out to you. We've had people incorporate sound in the boxes. So when you open it, it plays celebration music and it just instantly changes your mood and you get excited about the organization that you're going to be working for. 
So huge success rates there. I think, you know, when you think about what's next, so you've gone through all boarding now, early recognition is the next um, stage, I guess, of a recognition program. And many years ago, I think the industry and organizations as a whole really viewed early recognition as your precursor to a traditional service award program that started at five years and went five, 10, 15. But as employees shorten their tenure and they start to think about creating that great employee experience, then you started people saying or hearing people say, we really need to start earlier. Let's start at one year or three years rather than waiting to that five year milestone. But now, though, I think that early recognition is really going even shorter and it's becoming an extension of onboarding. So I know we just talked about the impact that a great onboarding experience can have, and we want to make sure that we're continuing that momentum. If you talk to employees about the early days in their position, if you're like me, you're going to hear stories about how they felt like they were drinking from a fire hose, totally overwhelmed. This new people, this new processes and overload of information, new jargon, new acronyms, new places, even just learning the way around your facilities. But we can use our recognition programs to help ease that transition and to really solidify that bond, the emotional connection, and help employees know from day one, we care about them and what they're doing. So maybe it's as employees reach key milestones in their training, we acknowledge their success in those. Or making sure that we're involving that immediate supervisor and having recognition come from them to make it extra impactful. Maybe it's um, managers setting the expectations. So when they have employees that reach certain milestones, they can send an e-card through the recognition site. Or maybe they start a team huddle, recognizing employees and the proficiency that they're gaining through their training. Whatever it is, I think the biggest key is just to be intentional in that communication and intentional involving the right people. Then as the days tick by, we recommend reinforcing with communication. Maybe it's an email that's sent at 30, 60, 90 days. We're working with an organization who's recognizing employees now for six months. So I think that whether it's the communication, whether it's a heartfelt message from your manager or the branded gift, all of those things really go a long way in developing the emotional connection that hopefully you started during that hiring process. So if you think for a second about your organization, you know what are you doing to establish that recognition culture early? Or where are your opportunities to reinforce the connection to your company, to your management team, and most importantly, to that immediate supervisor, even during that hiring and onboarding process? Hey, that Emily, opportunity, oh, sorry. I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask you, when you have like challenges that you have, what's like the most, I'm gonna put you on the spot and I apologize. We didn't script this out. But like what's like the coolest challenge you've seen around you know, early, intentional communication and early challenges to get people involved and, and recognize? You know, I think there are a few of them. A lot of it depends on whether it's an in-person event where it's easy to help people do scavenger hunts and they're going around through different places of the facility. They're getting the lay of the land as it relates to the physical place, but they're also meeting and interacting people from different departments, different levels of the organization, and they have different things that they're supposed to learn. And it's, you know, your day-to-day -day procedural stuff, but it's also about the culture and about the organization, the strategic priorities. Um, I think that when you have a very dispersed workforce, that's a lot harder to generate. And then it becomes in, how do you connect people um, across technology systems? Who do you have as a mentor? And maybe that person's reaching out in addition to the immediate manager. Or what expectation do you have from the manager that they're going to keep that high touch communication throughout several months? So I think that there are some different ones. Um, one of them, I think, though, really is a good segue into the next slide, and it's thinking about strategic communication and how you can create a challenge. Maybe it's during the hiring process and that onboarding as they're first joining the organization, but it could also be communication that's designed for the entire organization. New hey, Emily. Well, tenured. 
Yes. Emily, I'm, I, sorry to interject, but this is actually another timely question. And I think you're getting ready to, to, to definitely segue into some of the answers here. But it's an ongoing struggle and, and when it comes to these, what you're recommending. Um, and the question is about how do we get our managers and executives to start recognizing more readily their employees and how and to see how essential that is. And I I mean, share this deck with them. That's number one. <laughs> and the data that you had, right. <laughs> But I mean, you know, HR can only tell them and remind them so much, right? So maybe you're going to touch on this now because I think communication is a big part of this. It's the same with candidate experience as well as employee experience. So, but anyway, that's a question that we got. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And I am going to share an example because I think that really determining that communication strategy is key. And a lot of it has to be things that happen automatically and are incorporated into the daily flow of work or otherwise I think you're always going to struggle getting managers to own that completely on their own they have a lot of different priorities you know we've seen it take a lot of different forms so first of all maybe as an organization as a whole you could target all employees not just new hires and think about how you reinforce your culture so is it focusing on a different company value each quarter is it talking about strategic priorities pushing small bite-sized information to employees on a regular basis and creating some challenges or fun events around that are super helpful I think one of my favorite challenges and a way to really drive action is a challenge that we run often. And for us, it's within our recognition software, but it's asking all employees just to log into the recognition program and complete their profile. And the reason that we care about that is twofold. First of all, users who complete their profile are four times as likely to stay involved and engaged in that recognition program and four times as active in the program after just logging in, getting comfortable enough to complete their profile. But the other reason is that it creates a treasure trove of data for managers. So in your profile, you're sharing things about your privacy preferences, how you like to receive recognition. So we're probably all guilty at some point or another of assuming that all employees love their name and lights. They love to be recognized in front of their team members. And in actuality, that's not always the case. Sometimes people prefer that quiet message on the side where a manager pulls someone to the side and just lets them know how much they appreciate their work or how impactful the data that they ran was. So I think that providing and gathering that data is a huge key step. And this challenge to engage employees, to give them motivation to go in and create the profile, usually we create some fun around it. We say that a certain number of employees who complete their profile will be rewarded in some way. We've had people do it with Bluetooth speakers, um, with giving them points in the recognition program, tons of ways to do that. So now you're creating that motivation and you're also creating some fun and a chance to win. Everyone loves to win, right? That's why Vegas is so big. Um, so I think that once you get all of that data, then you have to figure out how to serve it up to your managers. And one of the things that we've done is after you gather the data, setting aside some time for the managers or a communication to them where you send it to them and say, hey, we've collected all this data, go look at it. So as you're getting ready to celebrate your next team member who has a service anniversary, make sure you go to their profile see how they like to receive recognition. Or did you know managers that you have the ability to do this? And I think one of the keys is just making it that small bite size, simple tasks that they can do very quickly, but just periodically. So even if you just send them an email once a month and create a challenge, you could certainly create some incentive for the managers to do it as well. Certainly they should see it in the engagement of their team members. Um, we've seen people include that in performance reviews for managers and really set that as an expectation that they're incorporating it as part of their day. There are tons of ways to do it. I mean, we have 90 day action plans, um, encouraging managers to just set aside 15 minutes in their calendar each week to do recognition. So um, I think that, you know, like we've said, you have to tailor it to your organization, what your managers are doing, your workforce, but like I said before, the biggest thing for me is to be intentional and to make sure that that immediate manager is somehow involved in the process. 
But like you said, Kevin, it can definitely be a challenge. So being creative and helping it stay fun certainly helps. Cool. Okay. Um, next, Liz, we can talk just a minute about employee well-being, because I think that when you look at the 2023 Fortune 100 best companies to work for list, you'll see that 83% of companies have a psychologically and emotionally healthy workplace. But a typical U.S. organization is only 52%. When you think about employee well-being, usually you're thinking about a work-life balance or mental health counseling. And those things are absolutely vital. They are important. It makes a difference in hiring and retaining great people. But I think that your recognition program also has a lot of merit and has a lot of ability um, to impact well-being. They go a long way in creating that sense of belonging and the team approach, helping employees feel like they're part of something greater. And I think that you know, we've already talked about several ways to do that. It could be you feel like part of a team because you're wearing your branded merchandise or you have that coveted thing that you earn through your recognition program that you can't get anywhere else. But I think that you're also seeing that employees are looking to connect to the larger organizational priorities and organizations are looking for new ways to support their employees. Um, one of the examples that we've seen come up several times lately is life-changing events and how we as an organization support employees who are experiencing a life-changing event. Maybe that's a wedding, it could be a baby or an adoption, the death of a parent, and we as an organization should be there to offer support. Typically, we have benefits policies that a lot time off. That's great. That's important. But how are we strengthening that emotional connection to employees when oftentimes they are the most vulnerable? So I think that if you think about a gift, for example, um, designed for the occasion with a heartfelt note from the manager, could be a blanket that offers comfort. Maybe it's a frame for a wedding that you put up and you have that constant reflection and those things, again, they're going to reinforce that emotional connection, not just when the employee receives it, but every time they use it. And I know for me, for my husband, um, he received a backpack leaf blower for a recognition program. And it sounds silly, but every time he goes and blows the leaves this time of year or anytime I see him, we're reminded that that came from the organization. And it reinforces that value every single time. Um, I think another thing that is important here when you think about employee well-being is thinking about employees and everything that impacts who they are as individuals and really celebrates their differences. So just simply making sure that your recognition program offers holiday cards for all holidays celebrated by your employees, no matter where they live, their home country, their religion, find cards that celebrate diversity, and then find ways in your communications to really bring those out and show that that is important to you as an organization. And those small things, they're usually no to low cost, but they provide a huge impact, even as the onboarding boxes that Darren mentioned earlier. Um, I think another thing is just finding ways for employees. If you think about the profile, I'll go back to that for a second. You know, that allows me to show who I am as an organization or as a person. Maybe it's my hobbies. Maybe it's my background, my skills. Things are important to me. So I've heard some talk about trying to take that physical scavenger hunt that I talked about before and creating a virtual one. So what if you encourage employees to go in and fill out their profile, and then you create a virtual scavenger hunt where you have it set aside 30 minutes and we're going to do a challenge. See if you can look up people and find someone who has the same hobby as you. Or maybe it's find the person who's the furthest away from you geographically in the world and introduce yourself. Um, just ways to create that fun idea again, but unite employees. It goes a long way, like I said, to the employee well-being, making employees feel like they're a part of something. And when we can create um, purpose and create those emotional connections, I think we will feel it, candidates will feel it, our employees will feel it, and it will make a difference in your organization. 
And when I hear you talking about this, because it's newer in the scope of all things around recognition, I also want to go back to one of the earlier slides that we had around what employees are looking for on your website. They want to see what you have from a recognition standpoint on your website. They also want to see what you have from a well-being standpoint on your career site, on your company web pages. That way they can connect with that emotionally. That is a ton of good stuff. Thank you for that. And I want to be cognizant of our time, so I'm going to try to wrap up a little bit of what we've talked about in, in just kind of a summary format. So engaging before day one is critical. Kevin talked about it on the hiring manager getting involved and making that phone call, whether it's a welcome gift, whether it's sending the agenda, helping them get through their background and drug screen checks, all those things, pre-hire paperwork, engage them before day one, and then send a welcome gift. Get them ready to start before they start. And part of that, too, is when you think about the impact that candidate experience is teammate interaction. We know they want to talk to other employees. We know they want to talk to the high manager. So schedule that. Make that part of your onboarding and your, your candidate experience that that is already pre-scheduled. Don't leave it up to that new hire on day one to go find teammates. That's that part of a scavenger hunt, and then it's okay. But other than that, help schedule that. And that all goes back into scheduling these social activities for the first day. So the first day doesn't have to be, okay, great, you're on the line now. Great, you're on five conference calls all day long. Half of them are, you know, benefits orientation. Schedule some social activities, whether you're remote or whether you're in person, build that time in to build that emotional connection overall. But having that plan really is important. It's important for the candidate so they can see it and know what the expectations are. It's important for the HR team and the onboarding team. It's also important for the manager to know what is this new hire going to be doing during their first day and their first week when they've once gotten started with the organization. And as simple as it sounds, equip them for success. Don't let them start without having a laptop or having a computer or having the right work and the, the work tools that they need. Make sure you have a process that's in place that will equip them for success on day one when they get ready to start. And we've also talked about getting a buddy. And this can be a formal mentor. It can be an informal buddy, but somebody they can go to to ask the questions that are not in the handbook. Like, well, is it okay? Or how do I ask off if I need to have off? What if an emergency happens? You know, what's the dress code? I know it says this, but what does it really mean? You know, those things, get them aligned with a buddy that they can ask all the questions that are not explicitly written in your handbook. And like Emily mentioned as well, introduce them to your recognition platform. Have them go in and let them get points for the first time they sign in and set up their profile. All of these little things that you can see we have listed here will help deliver a very impactful new hire and candidate experience for your organization. But we wanted to spend just a few minutes before we ended up. Like We know this is not an all-encompassing list. We would love to hear from you either in your chat or your Q&A. What other cool ideas or things that you've done that are either outside the box ideas for creating great candidate experiences or onboarding experiences? So I'll kind of stop there, Kevin, and, and flip it back to you to see if we've got anything that's out there. Or if there's any other questions, we make, you know, we can answer questions now too. So I've got a question about, and I mean you you kind of touched on this throughout the presentation, but you know, when budget is a consideration. Right. Um, and we know that a lot of discretionary spending and recruitment has been held close to the vest in the in this past year. How do I how do I balance that with, you know, ensuring that I'm recognizing not only my potential candidates, but obviously my employees? What are things that I can do to watch the pennies, basically, right, for for in, in implement, implementing some of the things you're recommending? Yep. I'll, I'll touch on something. I'll flip it to, to Emily to talk about it on the, you know, the post hire side, really. But, you know, recognizing someone for updating their resume or updating their LinkedIn profile is a simple act of recognition that costs nothing. And when you think about candidates, I and mean, you see it all the time on LinkedIn, like I applied to 47 different jobs. I haven't heard back from anybody. That is so simple. Just reply, respond to the candidates, keep them updated on where they are in the process, have a process in place. They'll engage with candidates regardless of where they are in the process, regardless of where they fall out of the process, just communicate with them and appreciate their time and effort so far in the process itself. And then they'll let you talk about non-monetary recognition. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are tons of ways to do it. It could be e-cards. It could be recognizing people at the beginning of team huddles. I think for me, when you get into small budget, it just means you have to be extra creative and you have to take whatever dollars you do have and make sure they're providing an impact. So for example, we have companies who will come to us and maybe they have $5 or $10 per person and they're talking about a big points program. That is not what you do if you have $5 or $10 per person, because if someone is really knocking it out of the park and providing an impact, you don't want to give them $5. So it's how do you be creative and say that for the majority of the time, we're going to create the recognition through the interactions that we have, through the communications that we have, and we're going to save those dollars to really um, hit the things that we know are going to provide the biggest return. And maybe it's the onboarding. Um, maybe it's safety. It's really looking at your organization and some of the key things that you may be struggling with or your key focal areas and finding ways to apply those dollars. I think that challenges where you have a chance to win is another great way to spread it out. But again, it's just making sure that you're extra intentional and providing it where it matters the most. And then everywhere else, blanket them with recognition through e-cards and communications. Excellent. Yeah, questions that are popping yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I get to those real quick, there was just a comment that, that Marianne mentioned about um, the most coveted items for her are personally handwritten notes cards from direct leaders of the company, personal and heartfelt. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. So we did have a couple more questions. How do we make sure all employees feel recognized and more included? Because unfortunately, bias exists and some employees tend to get more recognition than others. So how do how do we implement more inclusivity? Um, that's my take on the question, at least. Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, I think that's always a challenge that we're going to have. Um, some managers are just naturally better at giving recognition, but making sure that we spend time to train managers first and foremost, help them understand the importance of it, the impact that it can have on their teams. Like I said before, just incorporating it into daily processes, setting it as an expectation for them will be key. But I think also, I mean, we can't discount the impact that our peers can have or managers that we may have that might not be our immediate supervisor, but they're still team leads of other departments that see our work. And so just creating the idea that Really, you can recognize people um, no matter which team they're on, no matter who they report to, creating those opportunities are also key. And then, um, I mean, really, like I said, you want to get the managers as much as possible, but don't limit it to just the manager, I would say, is one way to do it. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and, and at a related note, the question, there was another question specifically about how do we motivate colleagues, I'm assuming peers, to recognize each other as well. Yeah, and I think it goes back to those challenges or fun ways. I mean, we've done things where we recognize or create challenges around sending e-cards. And if you send three e-cards within a month, then you're entered into a chance to win. And it's interesting. So we have an organization with about 30,000 employees, I would say. They got the CEO to issue this challenge to the organization. So show top-down support. They sent tens of thousands of e-cards. It was crazy within the first few months of the program. It's now years later, and they still remain our most engaged client when it comes to e-cards. So I think that creating that fun, getting the management team and senior leadership involved to say it's important is key. But once you really embed it into your organization, um, you'll see it take off. We know that people who are recognized are more likely to recognize others, so it can become contagious as you get it going. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I completely agree. And there was just another comment about we, uh, a couple of different comments, actually. Um, Lisa mentioned that we send out a tell me about your you survey, asking about favorite snacks, hobbies, pastimes, holidays, et cetera, but your bucket list, favorite book, movie use it as an icebreaker when they share the results with the manager. And then uh, Laura mentioned that we start all over all of our meetings with a few minutes of kudos and recognition, which is excellent. Um, and at every level of meeting, encouraging the behavior and recognition, and it really does help change those behaviors in a positive way, which I completely agree with. Absolutely. 
Um, we are about out of time, everybody. So we want to thank you all very much and thank Emily and Darren again for presenting all this great data. We'll make sure to send out the recording tomorrow. And if you have any other questions, um, did you have a contact slide, Darren, that you wanted to put up again or? There we go. No. <laughs> well, that's all right. You that you know that you can connect with Darren or Emily. Um, I'm sure on LinkedIn and re or reach out to Engage to Excel. And we want to thank everybody for attending today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Emily, for joining. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thanks. All right. Bye now. Bye. Bye.